Hi guys, welcome, welcome to another session of News in 30 Minutes. Today, we'll discuss the important issues on the 23rd and 24th of January 2024. On 23rd, there were less issues, so we decided to club both the issues on today's uh, session and do it once and for all. So usually, whenever there is less issues, in just if there is an issue just of one article, instead of doing that video, I'll just do it on the succeeding day, so you don't have to worry about it. In the Telegram, I received a lot of messages uh, of my users as well as students that they were missing the news in 30 minutes on that day. So I do apologize, but if there are, you know, one article, if there is just one important article in a day, then usually it is uh, not uh, productive to make the video on that day. So I usually will do it on the succeeding day. Okay. And one more issue is many of my students, they, you know, send the articles which has to be done, which they want it to be simplified or they want it to be, uh, you know, uh, explained in using 30 minutes. I do appreciate those, uh, you know, uh, gestures definitely. And do I, I, I also appreciate the proactiveness shown by my students. So if there are many users who feel that there is any interesting article that they need explanation or they need simplification, you can definitely forward me the article at this particular telegram ID. So I'll take a look at them and if it is definitely on the lines of UPC preparation, that is if the, those articles are pertinent to your exams, then 100% I will include them in the news in 30 minutes. Okay. But overall, what I realized is you people are definitely enthusiastic and this is what is making me be consistent and uh, definitely I appreciate your enthusiasm as well as your, uh, you know, uh, eager to learn current affairs. Okay, so with that, let us start off with today's news in 30 minutes and look at some of the important issues on the 23rd and 24th of January 2024. Okay, the first issue is late Karpuri Thakur to be bestowed Bharat Ratna. Okay, so basically uh, Karpuri Thakur was the former chief minister of Bihar and his work in uplifting the OBCs and working for social justice is what has earned the individual the highest civilian award of the country that is the Bharat Ratna. Okay. Now, why is this issue important? It is, this issue is important from your prelims perspective and the issue more is important from this awards. As you know, from the last two years, Awards has suddenly been a area of interest of UPSC. There is more questions coming in this section. You should be pertinent on important awards that are in news and should learn as I keep telling you the factual dimension. The factual dimension is what will help you get more marks in prelims. Okay. So let us look at some of the factual dimensions of the Bharat Ratna. Uh, just this one sentence. He will be the 49th recipient and 15th to be accorded posthumously. Okay, you should know this fact. He is the 49th person. He is the 15th to be accorded posthumously. So he is the 49th. That is in 2024, he is the first person to be given the award. So in every year, there are three people who are given Bharat Ratna award. Okay, so maximum is three. You cannot exceed more than three. So this 49 need not be the static number. You should keep tracing if there is any other award of Bharat Ratna that is given to any other individual. Okay. And it is the 15th award to be accorded posthumously. That is post their death. Okay. So now looking at Bharat Ratna as a topic of interest for UPSC, what are all the different areas that you should learn or you should know about? Okay. One is it is the highest civilian award in the country. It is the highest civilian award in the country. Okay. The next is, as you already know, there are 49 individuals who have been already granted this award and there have been 17 who have granted this award posthumously. Okay. The third is, this award is open to anyone. This award is open to anyone and this anyone can be uh, regardless of any race, any occupation, any gender as well as position. Okay. And the next is it is open to anyone as in it is open to the Indian citizens or it is also open to others as well. That is 
the people who do not belong to indian citizen also can get the bharat ratna award okay the next is it is given to outstanding performance it is given to outstanding performance or service okay now this outstanding performance of service should be of the highest order should be of the highest order in any field okay that is important in any field okay there is no specific field that is specified the only thing is it has to be an outstanding performance or service of the highest order in any field okay so that is the fourth one the fifth is the prime minister the fifth is the prime minister makes the recommendations the prime minister makes the recommendation to the president and the president will uh, announce the award okay so this is the procedure the next is the annual the award is given annually and the annual award is limited the annual award is limited to 3 per year it is limited to 3 per year the next is the seventh point the award does not come with it does not come with any monetary grant it does not come with any monetary grant so see these are some of the factual dimensions that you have to learn in order to be well versed with your prelims for the topic bharat ratna okay now the highest civilian award 17 given posthumously and 49 is the number of awards given currently it is open to anyone it is open regardless of any race occupation gender or position and also it is open to indian citizens or otherwise it is given to anyone for outstanding performance of service of highest order prime minister makes the recommendation to the president and the award annually is given and is limited to 3 per year and it does not come with any monetary grant so this is what is bharat ratna award and some factual part other part you should also know is uh, the first year it was instituted it was 1954 and year it was given to three people one is c rajgopal achari the next is sarvapalli radha krishnan and the next is c v raman so these were the three individuals stalwarts who were given the award for the first time okay in 1987 it was given to khan abdul ghafar khan okay in 1990 it was given to nelson mandela okay and in 1997 it was given to aruna asaf ali okay so overall these were some of the you know important i'm sorry interesting uh, you know awards that uh, uh, can be asked in the prelims others are very easy for you to guess whether they have received or not received so these were some things that uh, you know that that kind of were tricky that i felt that it is important one more thing is women women who have won the bharat ratna award includes one is indira gandhi 1971 the next is mother teresa 1980 the next is aruna asaf ali 1997 the next is ms subalakshmi 1998 and the next is lata mangeshwar okay 2000 sorry 2001 okay so these were some of the women who have won the highest civilian award of our country okay so these are some of the factual dimensions that you should you should make note of that you should know well versed with respect to bharat ratna as a topic so this is how if you take any topic you have to analyze and extract the factual dimensions if you have to score well in your prelims as you know prelims is becoming more and more factual you have to be good in this you don't have a choice it only comes with a lot of revisions don't put more pressure on yourself it just comes with a lot of revision so at one go only don't try to buy out all the facts just make sure that you uh, write down all the facts and keep it and you keep revising it many number of times as you keep revising it automatically you will get used to those facts okay so this is regarding the bharat ratna award 
okay the next is indigenous mobile hospital called bishm deployed in ayodhya this actually helped in saving a life so in the pran pratishta that happened in january 22nd an individual faced cardiovascular problems and heart attack and that individual or that uh, you know uh, that uh, that person was saved the life was saved only because of this so called indigenous mobile hospital okay again this is an article that was forwarded to me by my student and uh, since the you know the article is more pertinent for your preparation i felt that i it has to be included so i appreciate the student again for providing me this article and i do appreciate in the uh, future also for all those students who keep sending me articles for me to decipher or simplify okay with that let us get on with what is this bishm okay so basically there is something called project bishm okay so project bishm is nothing but bharat health initiative okay it is bharat health initiative for sahayog the full form of project bishm is bharat health initiative for sahayog okay it involves it involves a deployment of disaster management cubes project bishm involves the deployment of disaster management cubes and it is these cubes that act as mobile hospitals it is these cubes that act as mobile hospitals so they can ask you what is project bishm you should know that it is nothing but bharat health initiative for sahayog which is nothing but a disaster management cube this cube acts as mobile hospital okay now if i take this uh, that is project bishm and if i take this cubes so what are some of the characteristics of this cubes one is it provides medical support during emergencies this is what happened uh, during the ayodhya ceremony the second is it integrates it integrates artificial intelligence and data analytics it integrates artificial intelligence and data analytics to facilitate to facilitate coordination and real time monitoring okay so whatever is being done it is going to monitor real time the next is the whole unit the whole unit has only 72 easily movable components okay and the fourth is the cube can be deployed in just 12 minutes the cube can be deployed in just 12 minutes okay so this is some of the important factual part that is important for your prelims okay one is it integrates ai and data analytics the next is the whole unit as 72 easily movable components and the cube can be deployed in entirely in the matter of just 12 minutes however this particular project can be used as a case study it can be used as a case study in gs2 to show how we can enhance governance it can be used in gs3 to show how disaster response can be made very effective it can be used in gs4 in order to show how health can be taken as priority and how technology can be used in order to protect health so this is a very wonderful case study that can be used in different papers of your mains exam also so it is actually up to your discretion to make sure that you can use it anywhere you want to that is the beauty of case studies that you can use in your exam okay so this is the mains perspective also i have tried to convey as well as the prelims perspective so this is where about the project bishma okay the next is the odisha government seeks to urgently deploy kumki elephants from tamil nadu okay so basically what are this kumki elephants okay now one thing what you should understand is the reason why odisha government is asking tamil nadu's help is because the Odi in odisha there is worsening of in odisha there is worsening of human elephant conflict 
there is worsening of human elephant conflict and in order to overcome this human elephant conflict they have tried fencing they have tried pitting okay they have tried electric uh, fences they have tried different different aspect but everything has been not successful these elephants are able to uh, you know enter and not only uh, you know come in conflict with humans but also it is destroying the agricultural crops okay so this is a huge problem that is happening currently in odisha so now because this is the problem they have requested the tamil nadu government because tamil nadu government follows a successful model it follows a successful model and the name of that model is this kumki elephants okay so let us learn what is this again they can ask you in prelims what is kumki elephants which state does it belong to what is this pertaining to so they can just ask you in the context of what okay so you need to understand this from prelims perspective but you can also use this definitely in your mains okay in your mains you can use anything and everything in your paper it is completely up to your discretion that is the beauty of mains it is not as limiting as prelims in in prelims you either know you don't know or you take an educated guess whereas in mains it is all about you connecting the dots how well can you connect the dots make the answers multi dimensional how well you connect the dots makes the answer very mature and standing out that is it it looks like you are able to analyze the issue critically from all different dimensions so mains is a very interesting ball game and i request you to study prelims very hard so that you can get through and you can enjoy that moment of mains exam okay so again coming back to this kumki elephants so kumki elephants is basically a tamil nadu model this model is uh, where elephants are trained elephants are trained and they are utilized elephants are trained and utilized one for wildlife conservation they are utilized for wildlife conservation two they are deployed in they are deployed in conflict prone areas three they are also used to drive away wild elephants okay four they are used for forest patrolling and five they are used for rescue operations they are used for rescue operations okay so kumki elephants are basically elephants that are trained in tamil nadu which can perform these functions so basically the odisha government has asked four of these elephants which can be used in order to protect their man elephant conflict okay so this is what is the concept of kumki elephants now this is from the prelims perspective from the mains perspective this shows the use of innovation okay this shows the ingenuity ingenuity of man okay this shows how we can use animal how you can use animal productively to help both animals as well as man animals as well as man because by using fences there can be deaths on both the sides the animals can die as well as men can die so this is using animal productively to help both animals as well as man so this is kind of a case study that depicts win win situation it is a case study that depicts a win win situation so again this is something that you can use in your uh, you know mains exam to your utmost discretion okay you don't have to worry about that okay so this is about this issue the next is limits and borders okay limits and borders on the territorial jurisdiction of border security force okay the center must consult states before making decisions that impinge on their powers okay so let me talk about the bsf first okay so bsf is known as border security force this is also called india's first line of defense it is called india's first line of defense okay and it was established bsf was established in 1965 in the wake of 
in the wake of india pakistan war okay it was uh, in the wake of india pakistan war in 1965 it was established okay this bsf comes under ministry of home affairs and because it comes under ministry of home affairs it is headed by an ips officer okay and the bsf is also tasked assisting it is also tasked assisting crpf and the army okay it is tasked in assisting the crpf and the army in insurgency operations in insurgency operations okay so this is the background regarding border security force now what is the issue that is happening that is pertaining to the operational jurisdiction the operational jurisdiction of bsf okay operational jurisdiction of bsf okay now let me just give you a background before i get into this aspect i'll just give you a background of a list of paramilitary forces in india a list of paramilitary forces in india includes assam rifles border security force central industrial security force central reserve police force indian tibetan border force national security guard shashastra seema bal there is also there is also special protection group this is also called special protection group okay it is called spg okay these are some of the list of paramilitary forces in india i'll come back to this i'll i'll give you the prelims version again i'll provide you the factual dimension of what is important from prelims perspective in these uh, paramilitary forces but before i get back to this page let me explain what is happening with respect to the limits and borders on ter territorial jurisdiction of border security force it can be territorial jurisdiction or it can be operational jurisdiction it is the same so what what is happening is if you take this as uh, the border of india okay now if i take this now look at this this part okay this part is where this is the part where the border security force handles the you know guarding of the border and here it borders bangladesh so basically it is a force that takes care of the border between india and pakistan as well as it takes care of the border with india and bangladesh so this uh, force the bsf is placed in gujarat it is placed in rajasthan punjab jammu and kashmir and west bengal okay jammu and kashmir and west bengal so this is where the bsf is forced i mean is is guarding okay the bsf is uh, this is where they are residing and they are bordering the uh, i mean they are guarding the border so what happens there is something called territorial jurisdiction of territorial sorry there is something called territorial jurisdiction of bsf okay and in this territorial jurisdiction of bsf in gujarat the territorial uh, jurisdiction of bsf was uh, you know 80 kilometers okay 80 kilometers from the border was the territorial jurisdiction of uh, you know bsf in rajasthan it was 50 kilometers in punjab it was 15 kilometers and also in west bengal and assam in west bengal and assam also it is uh, assam is the reason is this okay it, assam so west bengal and assam also uh, it is uh, 15 kilometers so west bengal is 15 kilometers assam is 15 kilometers look at this this was the territorial jurisdiction of bsf okay now there is something called bsf act bsf act 1968 now this bsf act was amended the bsf act was amended and in this bsf act that was amended they try to standardize they try to standardize the territorial jurisdiction they try to standardize the territorial jurisdiction of bsf to 50 kilometers so in every state since because uh, because uh, i mean instead of having different different territorial jurisdiction in different different states 
they wanted to standardize the territorial jurisdiction or operational jurisdiction of the bsf to 50 kilometers so in gujarat they brought it down to 50 from 80 in rajasthan they kept it as 50 in punjab they have increased to 50 from 15 50 50 so they wanted to do this now the punjab government the punjab government because the territorial jurisdiction is increased from 15 kilometers to 50 kilometers the punjab government has gone to the supreme court of india okay and it is arguing that by going i mean by increasing the let me go to the next page the punjab government is arguing that by increasing by increasing the territorial jurisdiction of bsf this is in conflict with this is in conflict with article 131 of indian constitution it is in conflict with article 131 of the indian constitution okay the next is this territorial jurisdiction also affects the law and order jurisdiction the law and order jurisdiction of the police this is the two things that the punjab government is arguing one is the territorial jurisdiction of bsf because it is increased from 15 kilometer to 50 kilometer okay so this argument is now the conflict comes with the article 131 of indian constitution okay and the next is the law and order problem because it, it the bsf powers will come in conflict with the powers of the punjab police it is basically they're telling that it encroaches the powers of the punjab police okay now coming from the mains perspective what should be your analysis coming from your mains perspective the analysis should be one that such a move should not be seen should not be seen as encroachment such a move should not be seen as an encroachment of state domain it should not be seen as an encroachment of state domain the reason why it should not be seen as an encroachment of state domain is one border is an international issue okay and guarding the border guarding the border preserves the national security of india so guarding the border preserves the national security of india hence this will obviously will have higher priority okay so we should not see only with the angle of encroachment of state domain by increasing the operational jurisdiction or territorial jurisdiction of bsf the second analysis is see bsf mainly focuses on preventing bsf mainly focuses on preventing the trans border crimes it helps in preventing trans border crimes okay especially unauthorized entry especially unauthorized entry as well as exit okay however what you should understand is bsf does not have the power to investigate it does not have the power to investigate so though it is guarding the border it can catch those people who are trying to enter or exit the border and after catching the people it has to hand it over to the local police it has to hand it over to the local police because the bsf does not have the power to investigate so in a way it does not in a way it does not in any way encroach the powers of the local police okay and the last is by increasing the territorial jurisdiction of bsf the only thing that we are doing is we are merrily authorizing the bsf to conduct search and seizures okay so this is the only thing that you are increasing by increasing the operational or territorial jurisdiction so this analysis shows that it is not uh, you know encroaching in any way the domain of state government as prescribed in the article 131 of the indian constitution or is in not in any way in conflict with the law and order jurisdiction of the local police as cited by the government of punjab so all this analysis comes from mains perspective that bsf is not in conflict with the state government's uh, system it actually complements and works in close coordination with the state governments to tell you truthfully okay so this is the analysis part 
and i hope you understood what is the issue happening so this is where the entire the limits and borders look at this center must consult states before making decisions that impinge on their powers so the author is telling that they have they had to be consulted before amending the bsf act 1968 okay now i hope you understood the bsf the background of bsf and what is the issue that is happening now just like bsf there are some important uh, you know uh, our border paramilitary forces that you should understand if you take assam rifles okay some factual information that you should know from prelims perspective is one it was formed in 1835 it is the oldest of all paramilitary forces it guards 1643 kilometers of indo myanmar border okay guards the 1643 kilometers of indo myanmar border now one speciality about assam rifle is it has a dual control structure it has a dual control structure what is dual control structure is administrative control the administrative control is under the ministry of home affairs however the operational control the operational control is under the ministry of defense okay so that is one of the some of the important aspects of assam rifles but what is important is it is the one that guards our indo myanmar border okay and as i told you bsf it basically is bordering or it is guarding the borders of pakistan and bangladesh and it was formed in 1965 uh, and uh, it is uh, you know it is under the mha okay this is what is the border security force the next important force is the indo tibetan border force as the name suggests this borders the or this guards the border of indo tibet and indo china as the name suggests it guards the border of indo tibet and indo china it was formed in 1962 in the wake of in the wake of sino china war in the wake of sino china war and it replaced assam rifles it replaced assam rifles in sikkim and arunachal from 2004 okay it replaced assam rifles uh, you know in sikkim and arunachal from 2004 so this is some information that you should know in indo tibetan border force the next is sashastra seema bal this is a border force that was set up in 1963 now this will guard the border between india and nepal as well as india and bhutan okay and this is also deployed during elections for polling booth security okay the next is it was previously known as special service bureau it was previously known as special service bureau and this the main job of the special service bureau is in order to curb any anti national activities any anti national activities to curb it that was the main job of the special service bureau that which is now or today known as sashastra seema bal if you take the national security guard it was established in 1986 it was under ministry of home affairs and it is basically to counter terrorism so this force is basically to counter terrorism okay and the last is the special protection group this special protection group was formed in 1985 post the indira gandhi assassination so this special protection group is manned with the protection of prime minister the former prime ministers and their families okay the next is it comes under cabinet secretariat don't forget the special protection group comes under cabinet secretariat and this is formed under special protection group act 1988 okay see these are some of the factual dimensions that you should understand from the prelims perspective okay so i hope you got the you know clarity regarding how to go about your prelims preparation so this is regarding assam rifles this is regarding bsf which i have already learned the this is regarding the tibet indo tibet border force 
this is regarding the nsg the special protection group is here and sashastra seema bal is this okay so if you know this much this will give you enough confidence to face any type of pro, uh, you know uh, uh, questions that comes in your prelims regarding internal security and one more thing is whatever you studied this topic is very very important for your internal security of gs3 okay so knowing this uh, at the back of your hand is very very important for you to analyze your gs3's internal security so i hope you understood the limits and borders on the territorial jurisdiction of the border security force so this completes this issue okay so let us move on to the next issue the next issue is again a unfortunate event that has happened in gujarat and this issue is basically keda flogging incident which the police which which the supreme court has called as police atrocity the police has called this as uh, you know uh, an atrocity police atrocity what has happened is look at this in the 2022 incident four gujarat police officers have publicly flogged muslim women for tying them i mean after tying them to a pole in keda district for allegedly disrupting a garba event okay so basically the police is committing torture okay the police is committing torture okay now this police committing torture will amount to police atrocity okay now in the supreme court or in the supreme court one of the justice has given the statement it is the duty of every police officer it is a duty of every police officer to know what is the law laid down in dk basu what is the law laid down in dk basu okay so this is the statement that is given by justice b r gavai okay so justice b r gavai has told it is a duty of every police officer to know what is the law laid down in dk basu okay now there is a very famous judgment called dk basu judgment okay now this judgment is very important we will discuss that but basically this topic is important because one you can use this as your case study your case study in learning how there can be negligence how there can be egoism and how atrocity can happen when there is animosity against the people okay so all this can be different dimensions that you can use in your case studies in your paper 2 also in your gs2 also you can use this as well as in your gs4 you can use this this can be as a case study but we are we are uh, in, in in this particular uh, today we will be learning more regarding this particular statement given by our justice bk gavai which says that it is the duty of every police officer to know what is the law laid down in dk basu so our main agenda is to learn what is this dk basu judgment okay so basically dk basu judgment is a list of guidelines okay to uh, you know prevent harassment to prevent harassment and atrocities to prevent harassment and atrocities uh, by the police okay so basically you should have a clear understanding of this again this can come within the prelims also and mains also so you should have an idea of this guidelines the first guideline what they say is the police who is arresting the police who is carrying out, carrying out the arrest should have a clear identification the police who is committing the arrest should have clear identification that is they must be accurate and they should have name tags with their designation okay they should have name tags along with their designation that is the first thing now after arresting after arresting any individual that police must prepare a memo okay and this memo should be signed by a witness and it should be countersigned it should be countersigned by the arrestee 
okay so one it has to be it has to be signed by the witness and two it has to be countersigned by the arrestee that is the second uh, guideline the third is the person who is getting arrested that is the arrestee okay the arrestee can have the right to contact or inform to inform or contact any one individual this individual can be a family it can be a friend but that arresty who is getting arrested will have the right to inform or contact any one individual and in this uh, contact that person can give out the location that is the third guideline the fourth guideline is the person who is getting arrested if that person does not know about this right this right uh, about informing this right to inform someone if that arresty does not have this knowledge then it is the pertinent upon the police to make aware of this right to the rst okay so basically you have seen in uh, tv serials where in in uh, in usa the police once arresting says you have the right to remain silent you have the right to uh, um, uh, you know uh, a, a lawyer things like that so in that manner a police should make aware of the rst about their right that they have the right to inform one individual regarding their arrest as well as their location so this uh, this this is another guideline the next guideline is the rst the person who is getting arrested the rst should be examined the rst should be examined for any minor and major injuries and this should be recorded this should be recorded at the time of arrest the reason is the person who is getting arrested can then be uh, you know tortured with inside the jail premises or the police custody so if that should not happen the arrestee must be examined for minor and major injuries and that should be recorded at the time of arrest the sixth one is the arrestee should be subjected to the arrestee should be subjected to medical examination should be subjected to medical examination every 48 hours okay during his detention while that person is deta uh, detained every 48 hours that person should be uh, you know uh, subjected to medical examination okay now the next is during interrogation during interrogation that particular arrestee that arrestee must be allowed to meet is or her lawyer sorry is or her lawyer okay so that is the next guideline and the next guideline is the arrest that has been done it must be communicated it must be communicated to the police control room a police control room is present in every district of every state so when whenever an arrest is done it must be communicated to the police control room within 12 hours of arrest okay so these are some of the guidelines that are given in the dk basu judgment basically it is to prevent harassment and atrocities by police so this is where the justice b r gawai says that it is the duty of every police officer to know what is the law laid down in this judgment so just to give you a summary of it a police when the person is arresting someone the police is arresting someone they should be having a clear identification of id cards with name tags and designations after arresting they have to prepare a memo that should be signed by a witness who is present there as well as a counter sign by the arresty himself or herself the arresty must be informed that that arresty has a right to inform one individual their family or a friend about their arrest and location and if the arresty does not have or is not aware of this right the police must make them aware of this right the next is the arresty must be examined for minor and major injuries at the time of arrest and this must be recorded the arresty must be subjected to medical examination every 48 hours until that person is detained and during interrogation the arresty must be made available to meet his or her lawyer the next is the arresty must be communicated i'm sorry the arrest must be communicated to the police control room 12 hours after arrest so these are some of the important part of uh, you know the dk basu judgment that the police has to follow which was completely not followed in the keda flogging case which is a very unfortunate event which accounts to police atrocity okay so this is some of the issue regarding uh, the police atrocity let us go on to the next issue the last issue of the day is 
Rahul Gandhi stages dramatic sit-in protest in Assam for being denied entry in Bhattadrava Thaan Temple after he turned down the request to visit later. Again, this becomes political. We are not interested in this particular uh, political aspects of the news. What is important is again this Bhattadrava Thaan Temple. Okay, that is why this becomes important because that place is the birthplace of the saint Sankara Deva. Okay, so if you go on to Bhattadrava Thaan Temple. Okay, now this Thaan. Okay, Thaan. Let me just try it again. This T H A N Thaan. Another name for Thaan is Satras. Another name for Satras is Satras. So in the previous video, we had learned in depth about this Satras. So this Bhattadrava Thaan Temple is nothing but an other monastic institution. It is a neo Vaishnavite monastic institution. Okay, and why is this important? Is because this is the first monastery that is established by Saint Sankara Deva. Okay, it is the first monastery established by Saint Sankara Deva. The reason why this becomes the first monastery uh, established by Sankara Deva is this is the birthplace. This is the birthplace of Saint Sankara Deva. Okay, so this uh, saint is popular in 15th and 16th century and he is responsible for spreading neo Vaishnavism, neo Vaishnavism in Northeast India. Not only in Assam, but neo Vaishnavism is very, very famous even in Manipur. So it is in Northeast India, neo Vaishnavism is spread because of the Saint Sankara Deva. Okay, and to just give you a small background again regarding this, we have already spoken in depth about Satras. So let, let me now speak about Saint Sankara Deva. Okay, if you want to know about Satras, please see the previous video. Uh, satras are basically monasteries established by Sankara Deva. Okay, so Saint Sankara Deva establishes monasteries and the name of those monasteries can be Satras or it is also known as Thaan. Okay, now Saint Sankara Deva is, um, he started something called Eka Sarana Nama Dharma. Okay, he started something called Eka Sarana Nama Dharma. That can sometimes be called Eka Sarana. They can just use the word called Eka Sarana. Okay, so this Eka Sarana Nam means, see, one is Sankara Deva is a Bhakti saint and the Bhakti or the devotion is mainly towards Lord Krishna. The devotion is mainly towards Lord Krishna who is an avatar of Vishnu. Okay. Now, what is the speciality of Ekasarana Nama Dharma is basically here the emphasis is given on singing and congregational listening. Singing and congregational listening listening okay now what are they singing and congregationally listening they are basically focusing on they they are basically focusing on chanting the name or nam the focus is mainly on chanting the nam and there is no idol worship okay last time i made a mistake there is idol worship i told but no there is no idol worship maximum what they do is they keep a manuscript of they keep a manuscript of Bhagavata Purana. They keep a manuscript of Bhagavata Purana. And this itself becomes a place of worship. This can be used to worship. However, basically the focus is main, uh, mainly on chanting names, singing as well as congregational listening. So this is the main idea of uh, Eka Sarana Nama Dharma. That is, see, uh, Smarane means you are trying to, uh, you know, always uh, be in that universe by chanting the name of the God. That is the entire Dharma. So basically you are trying to uh, chant the name of one God and the God is Lord Krishna. So this is what is Eka Sarana Nama Dharma. Okay. And Saint Sankara Deva's Eka Sarana Nama Dharma is basically a unique. What is unique is it is called as worship through heart. It is known as worship through heart. 
okay so what is this worship through art approach is that is what instead of just praying uh, in front of the god here the worship is done through one is music the music is known as borgeet okay the next is dance we have discussed uh, in the last video also what is this this dance is known as satriya satriya is one of the classical dances uh, present in india so that is satriya so the next is the theater and the theater is the is known as bahona okay we have discussed uh, everything in the last video about this satriya and bahona okay so basically to summarize see this batadrava than temple is the first monastery established by saint sankara deva in the 15th and 16th century it is a neo vaishnavite monastic institution okay and there are many monasteries in assam that are set up like this these monasteries are known as satras or than okay now a little bit about saint sankara deva saint sankara deva is a bhakti saint who spread the devotion of lord krishna in northeast india and he started something called ek sarana naam dharma and that is rather than worshiping idol uh, rather than idol worshiping there is more emphasis on singing congregational listening and chanting the name of the god all this amounts to a uniqueness in the dharma that is known as unique worship through heart that is they perform some hearts in a way to show devotion towards the god and this performance is in the form of music that is known as borga borgeet in the form of dance that is known as one of the classical dance of india that is satriya or in the form of theater that is known as bona okay so this is something that you should know regarding saint sankara deva okay so i hope you enjoyed today's issues so if you have enjoyed then please make sure that you like share and subscribe okay thank you for all the love and support guys i hope you people are now seriously preparing for your prelims exam and if you need any help please do contact me if you have any articles that you need simplification of please forward it to me i'll be happy to help you people out thank you so much again i'll see you tomorrow guys bye